Hello and welcome to Susan's very special Halloween virtual event. Um, you can probably guess I am dressed in a, um, I guess, Willy Wonka costume in honor of Halloween. Speaking of honor, we are really honored to have Ferrara Candy as a special guest star for today's event. They are a customer, a customer of Susan's, and also a joint customer of Proteras, who is co-sponsoring today's event. So I know you guys all got goodies from Ferrera that we had sent out last week and earlier this week. But I do want to give you a little taste of how special of a workplace Ferrera really is. So let me share this quick video with you. Ferrara candy is a hometown favorite. There, of course, they made they made lemon heads, red hots, and so many more things. But there is a lot of magic that goes into making sweet Ferrara candies. And I got to take a tour of the place. Let's take a look. We're about to see where the magic is made. We got our hair nets. Check. I got my beard nets. Check. Let's go see where the jelly beans are. Very good. smells so good in here. The first process of making the jelly bean is making the center. That's where we blend the center ingredients, we cook it, and then we deposit it. Once shaken out, we're gonna take them and we're gonna load them into the pans. In the pan, we're going to put on a sugar shell of about 40%, doing that through wetting and adding sugar to absorb it. Once fully engrossed, we're going to unload them and put them into a polishing pan. There, we're going to seal them, put a nice glaze on them, unload, and send off to packaging. Ferrara can trace its roots in Chicago back over 100 years, and there's nearly 1,000 employees in the area that make the magic happen. But none of it matters unless the candy tastes good. And I can tell you, it sure does. And now I'm going to bring up my special guest, Kirk. Kirk from Ferrara, please turn your radio on. Hello. Hello. Hi. So Kirk, let's start by um, telling us about yourself. Like what um, do you do, what's your hobby and what do you do for Ferrara? Awesome. Um, well, for Ferrara, I'm a director of IT infrastructure and it's a, a basically the technical platform owner of IT at Ferrara. And includes things like servers, virtual servers, operating systems, storage, things like that. Um, I live in the Chicago area, uh, working uh, downtown with Ferrara, although I'm not there today. And um, I have two kids, uh, 14 and 11, a, a girl and a boy. Great. So the intersection of Sousa and Ferrara obviously came when you guys decided to migrate your SAP estate to AWS. So take me to the beginning of that project. I guess what what was the driver behind SAP migration to the cloud? Uh, well, Ferrara has SAP, and the reporting system system we had at the time just wasn't sufficient. So we looked at our options, and we chose Hana uh, running on SUSE Linux in AWS with our partner Proterra, um, and we started a migration to that platform uh, at the time. So. So I heard the initial migration, at least, was amazingly fast. It was done in something like less than 30 days. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, was, it was definitely less than 30 days. Uh, we had uh, a really good partnership and uh, a very effective working relationship, and things happened smoothly. How many people are on your team, Kurt? Ooh, like in this segment for uh, server infrastructure, there's three, four people. There's not very many. So, um, you know, we were able to get this done with a light group. So it was a pretty lean crew. Is that one of the reasons and motivators for moving to the cloud, like getting, I guess, more scale and more flexibility and also not needing to worry about some of the more day-to-day -day stuff? No, absolutely. Scale, flexibility, and, and worrying more about the core candy business and less about segments of technology that maybe we're not expert in. So. That makes perfect sense. So you've been running SAP now on AWS for a few years now. Um, what are some of the business benefits you, you're seeing? Well, I, I would say that the, the, this, platform, this platform has really been a pillar of delivery in a reliable, performant, and scalable fashion. 
Um, we've changed it, tweaked it, grown it, um, and it's been consistently stable, uh, consistently performant, and and has delivered the data that we've needed in the time we've, the, you know, the time that it's required. So. so a lot of customers are in your boat, um, just like you were a few years ago when you started thinking about migration. I guess wearing the hat of somebody who's gone through it, who's really learned a lot of lessons, what are some advice you would give to somebody who was at the beginning of this migration journey? Um, well, I, I would say that, that this platform that SUSE Linux, AWS, with our partner Proterra has been a stable and reliable platform for HANA. And uh, it's allowed us to focus on business value rather than our technical platform concerns. And it's really been a key factor that allows us to bring the best value from our platform over time. And in this line, that really kind of emphasizes the performance of, of selecting the right platform and partners in this kind of decision. Um, since you mentioned it, I'm going to ask a follow-on question. So what, what were some of your key considerations for selecting, for example, SUSE as a platform and for selecting Proterra as a consulting partner? Well, I think SUSE as a platform is a, a well-known, uh, stable and reliable, broadly supported Linux platform. So uh, it's established in the marketplace. I have history with it personally um, and knew it to be a reliable choice. Um, it's all, and it's also a key uh, supported platform for HANA as well. Um, Proterra it was a strong partner with all the right skill sets and uh, really came to bat in a collaborative fashion to make the things that we needed happen in the time that we requested. And they've always been th that way. It's been a, it's been a uh, continuing strong partnership with Proterra. That's wonderful to hear. So. Um, those were kind of my teaser questions, but I would like to open it up to all of our audience today to see if you have any questions to ask Kurt. You can either take yourself off mute and just ask it verbally, or you can put it in chat. I'll read it out loud. So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes if you're going to be typing to make this happen. No questions, really? Wow, we have a very, very shy audience today. All right, so let me then throw out a survey question. Um, I'm personally curious um, because SUSE is going to be a gold sponsor at AWS reInvent. And I know a lot of you guys got invited to this particular virtual event because you're also customers or prospects of AWS. So my question and or survey to all of you is, are you going to reInvent? So you can just put it in chat, yes or no. Uh, so we can take a quick look and see with, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, the pandemic may be possibly easing away how many people are willing to travel. So I guess Carrie's not able to make it. Anybody else? Yes or no answers either way? Not allowed yet. Yeah, there's a lot of companies still being very cautious of their travel policy. I can see that. Okay. Well, that's too bad, but those, are the, those of you that possibly, if your travel does open up between now and, you know, November, a month from now, uh, end of November, um, we would love to see you. We're actually right across, uh, fortuitously, from the SAP booth at reInvent, so look us up there, and I'll probably be wearing a racer outfit, because our theme is speed and racing this year. Okay, that was enough banter. Really, there are no questions, and I guess, Kirk, we can let you take a break and then we'll bring up our renowned mixologist. So for some of you that have attended SUSE events in the past, you know Justin as a world renowned mixologist. He has, I hope I don't get the number wrong, something like 60,000 uh, Instagram followers. And when Justin's not busy cooking up a fun cocktail for you guys like he's doing today, uh, normal years he would be hosting very exclusive parties in Hampton. So we're very lucky to have him. So Justin, I would like you to turn on your camera and talk to us about this special cocktail you created. Thank you so much for the intro, Helen. Let me get my headphones. There we go, beautiful. All right, everybody. So we have some fun cocktails for you all today. Um, but before we get going, uh, I would like to encourage everybody to turn on your cameras um, so that we can you know, engage and interact with you fully, all right? So first of all, uh, this is one of the most fun cocktails that I know to make, uh, especially for Halloween. Um, this is a cocktail that we actually came up with 
uh, a few years ago for this really awesome Harry Potter theme party we did, and it's just kind of perfect for Halloween. Um, so if you want to open up your kits, um, everybody should have received uh, most of the ingredients that we're going to need today. Um, you can crack open your kits here, and we can begin the process. Um, there are a few things that you might need um, to, uh, you know, obviously that aren't in your kit. First of all, ice, all right? You really can't make a good cocktail without ice. Uh, so make sure you get some ice handy. Um, we're going to want a glass as well. Um, I have a cocktail glass here somewhere. Um, one second. Michelle, can you grab my cocktail glass, the martini glass? Thank you. So get a martini glass. Um, and now for a shaker, uh, it's important that we have something that we can get the ice into and the ingredients into. So if you have a sports bottle or like a soup container, anything with a lid on it that we can shake, uh, that's going to be a great tool. And of course, if you actually have a cocktail shaker, um, even better. So that's what we're going to do there. Now the cocktail that we're making today, this is, uh, got a really fun twist to it. So it's kind of like a Pisco sour. Uh, with a little bit of uh, pineapple juice, um, lime juice. Uh, it's, it's really a fun one. So uh, first of all, we're going to need um, a can of pineapple juice. That should be in your kit. And um, we need uh, a lime that is also in your kit here. You're going to need a paring knife. All right. And you have some of this really cool activated charcoal. Let me see if I can find that too. All right. It's in this little bottle here, okay? Um, pineapple juice, Pisco. Pisco is a Peruvian liquor. It's really, um, re really an interesting liquor that I'm excited to share with you guys today. Uh, not everybody's familiar with it. Um, it's a really good sort of. Uh, I, I wouldn't compare it to vodka. It's something like a cross between flavor-wise, um, uh, like a grappa, uh, because it is made from grape, um, and like a vodka. So it's it's not as intense as grappa. Um, not as like botanical and scent as say gin. Um, it's its own thing and it's really cool. And Barsol, they make an amazing piece of it. It's one of my favorites. All right. You should also have, um, let's see here. So you have your lime and you have a little bit of simple syrup as well. Simple syrup is really, as the name suggests, very simple. It's just sugar and uh, water combined. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the method, right? So Whenever you're making a cocktail, you always want to go non-alcoholic ingredients first, all right? And in this case, that's going to be our lime juice, our syrup, um, even our activated charcoal, which is just like a, a charcoal made from coconut husk. It's really simple. It's going to make the cocktail this awesome black color, and uh, it's also uh, an ed ed edible ingredient, right? So it's a, it's a really fun one. So let's take just a tiny bit of this activated charcoal. And when I mean tiny bit, I mean like really tiny bit. We're going to use like one sixteenth of what's in this little glass jar. Really just a very small amount. So just tap, tap that out. Okay. A little bit goes a long way. Perfect. And close it up. You can save that for another day. And then we're going to squeeze our lime in there. Now, something really cool about uh, limes and lemons is that one lime is basically like a whole uh, ounce of lemon juice. So you don't need to measure it. And the same thing is true of, le uh, of uh, lemons and limes. By squeezing a full uh, lemon or lime in there, you're getting almost a perfect ounce. So let's just squeeze all this out into there. Now, if you're using a sports bottle or a quart container or whatever you can, that's fine. We're going to do that in the same way we're doing this. We're just going to make sure we get all that juice out. Okay, really try to get it all, okay, perfect. Next up, we have our simple syrup. So simple syrup, it's going to be three quarters of an ounce. All right, so we're going to go to taste, right? Let's not put three quarters of an ounce will be something like one, I would say a third of this bottle will be three quarters of an ounce. So let's not... We're crazy. We can always add more. Let's just put that much for now. That's perfect. Before we start shaking it, we'll give it a little taste so we can get a sense of what um, you know what we're working with. And then now, uh, two ounces of Pisco. That's going to be this entire bottle. Okay. 
and then quarter ounce of pineapple juice. That's just going to be a splash, okay? Splash of pineapple juice. Give this can a little shake so we can make sure it's all mixed up. That's perfect. Okay. Then now, if you have a spoon or a straw or anything that you can kind of give it a little taste with, this is where we'll, we'll test the sweetness levels, right? Because we didn't have a measuring tool to measure that simple syrup, so this is a good time to see if we need to make it a little bit more sweet. I'm going to make it a little more sweet. I think it needs a little bit more. Okay, perfect. Right now, it really is a preference, you know. Oh, yeah, that's really good. Okay. Now, I might even make mine a little blacker with this charcoal. You can see the charcoal is doing something really cool. But we can go a little bit more spooky, if you will. And put a little bit more charcoal. Perfect. All right. Now we're ready for the ice. Okay. So we always add the ice after we've added the ingredients. And there's really a uh, good reason for that. That is, you know, as, as you can see, we've been taking our time as we've built this cocktail, right? Um, we, we put a little bit more sugar. We taste, we taste tested it. You know, we took our time to get that, those flavors really correct. And if there had been ice in there this whole time, we would have just been sitting there and it would have been diluting. Um, and that's not what we want because when we shake a cocktail, that, especially one that has juice in it, we're doing three things. We're doing, trying to do them all equally. We're trying to add air to the cocktail, right? Adding air to the cocktail brings out the vibrance and the flavors. We're diluting it, which is important to take away some of that bite. And we're chilling it, right? But we want to do them all equally. That's why we always add the ice afterward. So now that we've got all of our ingredients and the ice inside the shaker, we're ready to shake it up. Now, if you have a shaker like the one I have, which is called the Boston Shaker, it's a two-piece. You want the small side above you, uh, up top. If you have a cobbler shaker, which is that three-piece guy, the same deal. You want the small cap up top. Now we're just going to shake, but with big motions, using the full range motion of our, uh, our arms. And if you're using a cork container, do the same thing. Just get that lid on tight, and we're going to shake it up like that. I'll show you. Let's go. All right. By using the full range of our arms, we are adding as much air to the cocktail as possible, which, again, is bringing out the vibrance in those flavors. All right. Once it's shaken, we're going to disconnect it. And we will strain out the cocktail from the ice. Beautiful. Okay. Now, for garnish, we have a really fun thing. Now, if anybody's familiar with Harry Potter and the you know, the movies or the books, uh, you know that there's something called the sorting hat. And the sorting hat is this hat everybody puts on their head, and that tells them what house they're in. Um, and uh, the sorting hat, you don't really get to choose. The sorting hat just gives you a house, and that's how that works. So depending on what you've got in here, that tells you your house. And this is like an edible wafer print that we're just going to drop right on top of the cocktail. We're going to float it. Okay. And let it settle. It's really cool. It should, get, it should lay flat if you just give it a second there. All right. That's it. Where am I? I'm in Ravenclaw. All right. Not bad. Sorry for all you Slytherins out there. But cheers, everybody. Sorting hat. Hey, don't bash the Slytherins. Susan's color is green, you know. We like green. Hey, you don't – there's too many people in the, in the Slytherin house for them all to be bad. I've got some good qualities. Cheers. Couple questions. Um, is this considered a Peruvian cocktail, or is it like something that's purely of your own invention? Oh no, I mean, definitely. Um, activated charcoal is a very like new sort of fun ingredient. Um, it's not. Uh, I mean, it has it has pisco in it, so it's Peruvian in that, that way. But it's not like a classic cocktail. It's um, just a, a great twist on the pisco sour, which is uh, a classic uh, pisco cocktail. Pineapple juice, lime, all those ingredients are, are really um, uh, just common ingredients that you find in a lot of cocktails. And this cocktail would work well with gin or whiskey or any other um, uh, spirit, but I think it's very interesting with Pisco. So we see a couple of people sharing uh, 
what they are, what their cocktail has revealed. We see a Slytherin, we see a Ravenclaw. We welcome and encourage the rest of you to also tell us about what house you got into. Yeah, and, yeah, tell me. Uh, let us know. And also, what do you think about the cocktail? How does it taste? Um, yeah, let's tell us how, what you think. I know that this cocktail is good, so. So you can but take yourself you out and say do it, it again, right. or just put it in the chat. Let us know what you think about this cocktail. Ravenclaw in the house. All right, I see that. LOL. I'm not sure how I feel about being a Slytherin. Hey, that's funny. You know, it's funny. It's funny when we make this cocktail at events because at events, you know, or behind the bar when we're making it for guests, we are choosing what house you get. So it's kind of funny. It's a passive aggressive way to like, you know, uh, give a, a nasty guest uh, a cocktail. I'll be like, oh, sorry, you're in Slytherin. It wasn't me. It was just what we grabbed. So I actually happen to be a huge Harry Potter fan. So I'm really curious about your Harry Potter party. What are some other cocktails you had created, invented for that particular party? Oh, that was an awesome one. Actually, could you grab me that tea kettle, babe? Um, so we had one cocktail on the menu. So this was one of the cocktails, really awesome. Uh, but we also had uh, this other cocktail. So it was honey, bourbon, uh, honey, bourbon, lemon and rosemary but we served it in a tea cup and we pre-batched it and we put it in this in these kettles like lots of them but we filled the kettles with dry ice so they would smoke out wow. of the spout and they would actually start to shake the the dry ice would, would create this reaction so they were like shaking and the, the top was going like this and and it's dry ice smoke was coming out of it and pouring it into the teacup over a large clear cube and it was like it was so cool it was like one of the coolest things we've ever done uh that what else did amazing. we yeah yeah i think that was and then the sorting hat and then there was, there was a third one but those two were really stole the show yeah awesome so now we are going to transition from harry potter and magic and cocktails back over to it my way of transition is actually a harry potter related uh trivia question so can anybody tell me at what age do a budding wizard or i guess it's a wizard both in the female and the male gender anyways at what age do they go to uh, hogwarts year one so you can put ah uh, jill knows her harry potter and she put in 11. 11 is a very magical number and on 11 11 11 a.m pacific this year susa is doing our next webinar about how you get more value out of aws so Go register today, and how you find it is pretty simple. It's bit.ly, B-I-T-L-Y uh, B-I slash Sousa1111. You're going to be able to find it. So it's going to be a magical webinar. All right. My plug is done. Now I'm going to bring in my next speaker, and that would be Jayton from Proterra. Bye, Justin. Thanks again, as usual. Oh, thank you. Have a good one, guys. Take care. So, Jayton. Bye. Turn on your video and spotlight you as well. Blair, are you spotlighting him? Sorry, I'm not able to see. Oh, there he is. Hi, how are you? I'm doing good, thank you. Thanks, Helen. So let's start with an introduction of yourself as well. Do you live in Chicago just like her? Absolutely, yep. Yeah. So Kirk is about uh, 25 minutes from me. Um, actually, they have a production, uh, big production unit in uh, in the same town where I live. So I'm, I'm near Naperville, um, and they have a big uh, production unit in Bolingbrook. So I'm actually the director of application management services group for Proterra, and uh, basically it's an SAP practice that I lead. Um, and uh, yep, we have been uh, partnering with uh, Ferrara for many years now, and then uh, yep, so we have been uh, we have been running this digital transformation journey for Ferrara from about seven years now and uh, it's been a great relationship so yeah that's my role so let's dive in a little bit on this project so you talked about the timeline being seven years so far um, i guess give us a little bit sense of the scope like how many people on your team worked on it what were the phases like you know starting with you know planning envisioning architecture i guess you must have had some kind of pilot testing and all the way to go live just talk to us through the whole process Absolutely. So it's been, see, um, when the journey started, obviously, uh, as a as lot of smart IT management leaders took a decision to go to cloud, uh, to the right cloud partner, to the uh, right platform, 
with uh, you know hana as a database platform and for for their analytics needs as you can imagine for all that candy business their their analytics team needed a lot of reporting they already had a, a tool a, a platform which was not kind of sufficing their needs with hana uh, you know a revolutionary uh, developments happened and and, and the team from farara side was uh, smart enough to choose the right platform right so this is where it started the analytics platform was their first uh, journey to cloud uh, while um, the sap portfolio and the business applications were being managed by the farara infrastructure team at that point in time but um, the whole implementation of hana and then the business objects uh, on the analytics platform took very uh, short time with the standard and proven methodology that we always recommend to our customers with very specific requirements and, and um, you know engagement from business side we were able to identify um, exact you know um, sort of a platform that they want they wanted to build and then we actually were able to identify a path for it you know to to kind of scale up and scale out on top of it so this platform has been built with a multi tiered environment where it actually allows the customer to kind of you know scale up and scale down as they need um they do have a lot of flexibility around you know scaling out the environment as well if somebody has any specific questions around those technical terms i can always expand and explain the details around it but as as part of the um digital transformation journey that was actually their first success and then it never stopped right we have we have defined a three year roadmap which actually uh, worked successfully where uh, gradually the applications that uh, needed any scalability or any expansion of um infrastructure footprint was chosen to be moved to cloud as a natural choice right so this is how the whole journey ran for the farara team and and it was um, uh, you know just about a, a two month back we actually migrated the most critical business applications the entire sap business suite uh in sap cloud like in in the aws platform now <clears throat> with uh, suse as an operating system platform so everything is um, is now finally moved so all the most critical business applications of farara now runs on aws with managed by Proterra. So a couple of follow-up questions. You mentioned briefly that you guys have a pretty standard methodology for grading a customer um, SAP to the cloud. Can you expand on that a little bit? What does this methodology look like? Absolutely. So it depends on the SAP platform and the uh, you know factors like the size, the environment, and the allowed business downtime. We have, um, you know, t-shirt based model for for those uh, you know changes and 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 for those migrations so these are the standard methodologies that we have used and the and the inputs that we have taken so let's say when you are migrating a analytics application like hana versus when you are migrating a oltp application like sap business suite the methodology changes because um you may have different kind of business users and the allowed business downtime so we we basically use multiple platform tools that Proterra has themselves and, and SAP recommends along with AWS. So SAP, AWS and Proterra best practices were used in migrating this. But the most important um, aspect around this whole journey, right, making all the projects successful was the involvement, the right mix of the involvement from uh, the technical teams from both sides and the business team, which actually allowed us to make it successful. Since you have been very close with Ferrero throughout this entire journey, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with some of the business value they got out of the system. So what would you say are like the top one or two real business results that we can maybe define in, you know, percentages or metrics um, to share with this audience? Absolutely. So the biggest thing that any customer wants from, um, you know, this kind of platform is availability, right? So Ferrara has zero incident for their HANA systems availability in last two years. Zero percent unavailability, everything is up and running for their environments, which basically allows them to run their analytics. Every night and uh, with various schedules, Ferrara production facilities require some reporting. And based on those reports, the business decisions are taken. So, so you know, that is number one KPI that we have achieved for Ferrara. 
And uh, along with that, we allowed them to scalably upscale their environments. Because as you can imagine, the business grows, the new production unit comes in, and the same reporting platform may not be able to provide the uh, processing capabilities and the volume of uh, data processing that they are looking for. So we kept on expanding and uh, scaling out and scaling up those environments without making them change any um, underlying platform, um, you know, capabilities, which basically is a, is a very important uh, aspect around this whole platform, because uh, if you have to change your data centers, if you have to move somewhere, it basically allows a lot of disruption. It requires a lot of disruption. And, and that is what is not allowed in a business kind of Ferrara, right? They do production all the time and uh, candies won't stop. <laughs> right. We don't want the candy chain to stop. Um, so you were talking about HA and, you know, zero downtime. That obviously is perfect for like the SUSE perspective because our HA is about like the, the biggest key differentiation of what we do. And our tagline is literally zero downtime. So I just love all of that. Um, so throughout this process, obviously, your team has been working really closely um, with the SUSE software, right? SUSE Linux Enterprise Server for SAP. So can you tell me a little bit about just your team's experience using our product? Absolutely. So SUSE is our, our de facto standard choice of platform when it comes to any HANA implementations on any public cloud platform for, for Proterra. Uh, and the, there are very obvious reasons for it. Uh, with the earliest adoption and certification that uh, SUSE has achieved with SAP products, we are very comfortable implementing all the variants of SUSE. Depends on the customer requirement, we allow them to implement all the standard certified variants. But the most popular is SLES for SAP, uh, which is one of my favorite because it allows us to give a lot of uh, extensions to the operating system that are kind of natively built in for all the SAP business suite implementations where we need, you know, any um, highly available platform. So, so that's pretty, pretty much um, uh, our stand on SUSE. And then we have been very successful in all the implementations that we have done for um, all public cloud platform with SUSE as a platform. Thank you so much. SUSE really sees Proterra as a very highly valued partner. So Kirk was obviously, is obviously a very, very happy customer. Um, so what's what's your secret sauce? How are you guys to have you know one after another? Every customer of yours I talked to seemed to be quite happy with the tariff. The platform and the team that we bring in for the customer and the transparency and honesty around uh, their business requirements. Um, that allows us to really set the expectations very solid from the day one. Our experience around implementing public cloud has been um, you know enormous. We actually were the first partner bringing the first productive SAP instance on AWS in 2012. So we actually made SAP live in AWS platform in 2012. So wow. from the beginning of the time, yep, we were able to um, work with these platform providers and then we were able to share our experience with them. Uh, at that point in time, other providers thought that, you know, public cloud might really end up killing my private data centers and the business around it, but we were visionary to see that this is not really about you know um, um, you know managing an, an environment in a in a small segment. This is a lot, This is about giving you a new platform, the next generation platform where customers will grow, and we we know what happened, right? Uh, especially 2020 and 2021, and and I can only see the future five years. I can see that the industry is revolution revolution revolutionizing, and I think we're looking for probably a 300, 400% growth in cloud adoption. And when it goes through, uh, obviously our experience, our platform, our ability to manage thousands of uh, instances with smallest possible downtime with all the automations that we have built around all this platform is going to help. So this is really the secret sauce. Farrar actually have hundreds of systems. Um, we only talked about analytics platform, but they actually do have a lot of uh, environments that we run for them now. All of them are extremely critical to the business and, uh, um, you know, allow um, technically with all the cloud options and, and the way how platform is being implemented for Ferrara is helping them tremendously in all aspects of business, including actually the fact that the end users are now able to use the cloud and the workspaces to actually use SAP systems. So their SAP environments are not being used directly through the laptops. 
it is a very secure and solid platform through which they are able to now run their SAP application. So there is no dependency from anywhere in the world. You as an IT director would not be worried that my environment is not being securely accessed because you are giving you the secure, you are giving you a layered and secure platform so it can be accessed securely. So you mentioned the future a little bit earlier. So my closing question to you is what's next for Ferrero? What are they going to do in 2022 and the years beyond? Well, they have a they have a pretty solid roadmap. And as you can imagine, from the beginning of time, they've been very thoughtful about this journey. So as we have recently gone live with their uh, um, SAP business critical platform, um, we are now working on the fine tuned business requirement around the availability. So pretty much all the environments that were not uh, highly available in the on-prem scenario are being considered for highly available uh, setup because now cloud provides them that option. With SUSE HA extension, we are considering all those uh, implementations. We are also considering uh, some data lake implementations now, as we can imagine that, you know, the next move to the digital transformation journey, once you have OLTP applications in cloud is really data lake. So that's one of the aspects being considered. There are a lot of additional acquisitions and, and uh, mergers happening in the business and allowing them to run those transactions for the business without disrupting any applications or, or kind of drastically changing anything around the businesses is really the number one goal for Ferrara. And we are, we are all empowered and, and set to do that. So that's pretty much what uh, we're looking for the near term future. That's very exciting. So I have finished all my teed up questions. So people in the audience, this is your chance, right? Jason is super technical and he's a hands-on practitioner. So if you have any questions about the migration process, tips and tricks, now's the time to ask. You can again put yourself up. Yeah. 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 Sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, you see? Yes, yes. 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 Oh, right. Oh, thanks for coming. Okay, I think what's uh, happening is yeah, we're hearing somebody's phone conversation. So let's mute that person, Blair, if you're able to help. Mute that guy. Thank you very much. Okay, no other questions? All right, let's give Jason a break. Oh, there we go. Okay. Have you had any customers require that require you to deploy or migrate SAP to both AWS and AWS Outpost environments? Um, for those of you that don't know about Outpost, um, it's sort of AWS's way of actually putting like a, a, literally one of the racks from their own data center into your data center. So you can keep it private in the sense it's physical security, but you can access all the AWS kind of functionality. So that's what Outpost is. Um, also, any special requirement to minimize latency across like a deployment that's in the AWS cloud and on Outpost. So question for you, Jayton. Thank you. Yep. So technically, we were able to successfully give all the security aspects and, and comfort the customers around their uh, environments to make them successfully move to cloud. We have not had any situations where we had to co-locate their racks. But um, about the latency, the most uh, you know popular choice and then the default option that we always recommend the customers, and this is something that SAP also recommends, is Direct Connect. With MPLS and, and all the um, you know redundancy around their internal network that has been built up and set up with, with the right choice of uh, region, we are able to successfully you know achieve the KPIs that SAP recommends for the for the latency. And SAP GUI actually allows you to tune to an extent with all the internet uh, traffic available throughout the you know North American and, and pretty much the entire American region globally actually. I have not seen any issues with uh, latencies with our uh, public cloud customers once they choose the right uh, network topology. So just to be clear, Jaden, it sounds like you haven't actually helped the customer deploy on Outpost. No. Okay. We have not had any such uh, demand yeah. per se. We definitely have hybrid customers where they will have a solid network between their uh, you know, on-prem and, and cloud environments. But James, that is a very interesting question, and I would love to follow you up with you on that because we're trying to explore these use cases. So look for a calendar invite from me. Thanks. Anybody else? Any other questions for Jason at this time? 
Okay, in that case, then thank you so much, Jason, for joining us. And I will invite up, because um, Jason mentioned HA, right? I will invite up the biggest HA expert I know, and that would be Sherry Yu from SUSE. Hi, Sherry. Hello, can you see? Yep, I see now I see you. So just like the other presenters, tell us about yourself. What's, you know, where do you live? What's your life like? What do you like about working at SUSE? Yeah, absolutely. So I joined the SUSE about 16, 17 months ago um, last year during a pandemic, uh, but I'm happy to be here. I've been a SAP solution architect for over a decade, um, specifically working around the HA uh, area. So this is uh, dear to my heart to uh, hear that the big plan, um, you know, to uh, for the next step. So um, SUSE is here to uh, help um, with all the develop uh, the deployment. Um, and uh, back to uh, your question, uh, I, I live in the uh, Pacific Northwest uh, in the Washington state. I just moved here during the summer from uh, Northern California. So uh, right now I'm experiencing a little bit of the uh, raining experience, but it's, it's been nice so far. And uh, I have one uh, boy in middle school. So yeah, that's about me. Great. Well, thanks. So Sherry, um, a lot of people don't actually know, I mean, people, they've heard, obviously, everybody knows Susan who's on this webinar, but a lot of people don't actually know how strong Susa is in the SAP space overall. So at the danger of tooting our own horn, can you elaborate a little bit on like super, like exactly how strong is Susa's leadership in the SAP space? Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, SUSE is the leader in the open source space. So there is an illusion sometimes uh, people feel that, oh, it's open source, then uh, everyone can just grab the source code um, and support it, adopt it and support it. Um, but uh, very often I want to uh, highlight the difference uh, as being the developer versus the adopter. There's a huge difference in the level of the expertise. And um, especially when it comes to the uh, HA solutions, uh, SUSE has been working closely with then, SAP and also the customers to identify the challenges. Sorry, one sec. Blair, would you mind muting? That? Thank you. All right, sorry, continue. Yeah, no problem. So um, all the HA solutions based on the pacemaker um, for SAP HANA or Land Weaver uh, are discovered um, in the, based on the customer uh, challenges by SUSE and then SUSE started uh, piloting idea, uh, trying to get some uh, solutions. For example, uh, right now the, the HANA uh, scale out can run in the pacemaker uh, scenario. And that one was actually discovered by uh, SUSE back in 2015. And they started a pilot program, a pilot with a customer in Germany. And when that became successful, uh, SUSE think, okay, this could be a very um, popular scenario to be uh, adopted by other customers. Then uh, SUSE started the, uh, the official support. And uh, a lot of testing has been done uh, based on the underneath um, uh, infrastructure. So uh, behind the scene, when uh, SUSE port the solution from on-prem onto AWS, there is an yeah, army yeah. of engineers working behind the scene to test, to make sure that um, pacemaker the layer works uh, in a, a cloud or uh, works seamlessly with the underneath cloud infrastructure, and also we have identified some customer challenges. For example, um, AWS discovered that they want to uh, support uh, the HA scenario uh, within multiple users' accounts, and they, re they send a request, and uh, very quickly, uh, SUSE um, created that that support. So that's a demonstration on how we uh, jointly discover customer challenges, identify new scenarios, and uh, work together to, to provide a solution. And of course, there's the obvious metrics, like we own something like 85 plus percent of this particular market. We have 30,000 customers worldwide running SAP on SUSE. So it's, it's testament to the two decades we've been working together with SAP on you know, very deep collaboration at the engineering support just across all different levels. So yeah, absolutely. The market uh, dominance is a blessing for us to work sometimes with the, the corner case that um, may not be discovered in the uh, other situation, but because we have so many coverage and uh, you know, we sometimes we focus on those corner cases and make them 
a possibility. So Jayton talked about scale out and scale up being some of their 2022 plans for Ferrero. So that's really exciting. Um, can you give the audience more of a taste of like what does SUSE do in the HA space? What's our special sauce, such as live patching and those things? So in the HA space, uh, we focus on uh, both the um, to reduce downtime for both the uh, unplanned um, uh, downtime and also planned downtime. So uh, this could be a one hour uh, webinar because I very often I run that and you're welcome. If you have such interest, I can point you to some uh, pre-recorded uh, um, record, uh, sessions from the past. Uh, but I'm also happy to answer any specific question uh, regarding the design that you are working on right now for your uh, uh, particular uh, landscape. Um, but what I want to say is uh, we focus on challenges, uh, as I already mentioned, and also the solutions. So for example, what we have found is a lot of customers struggle with um, the parameters, because there are so many uh, settings that you can play with, and so many settings could go wrong that actually um, cause some trouble. So uh, we have uh, created a solution to automate the uh, installation and the configuration. So you don't have, uh, there's a, a zero chance to make any uh, human error, right, by, if, uh, in, by doing the automation. And what's new on the uh, landscape is the uh, validation. So um, we are working on a project called uh, Trento, uh, which is going to be part of our Slash for ACP uh, product, is the uh, validation of all the uh, settings in the uh, cluster. And we're going to work on some AWS specific uh, checks. Uh, what happens is a lot of times uh, customers say, OK, I, I follow your best practice, but I still get arrows from cluster. Uh, what's going on? And it turned out to be uh, the limitation in the set, uh, in the permissions that you need from the uh, cloud, uh, from AWS EC2 layer. You just need uh, uh, enough permissions in your role and account to be able to uh, config uh, the pacemaker cluster. So in that case, the arrows doesn't seem to be from to be related to the um, to the uh, cloud infrastructure. So they open ticket with SUSE then we, we troubleshoot and find out the root cause. So in order to help customer to uh, avoid such um, uh, uh, time waste, uh, right now we are working with AWS to identify, okay, so um, if you're gonna uh, use Trento to pre-validate your cluster configuration, and uh, once we identify this is on AWS, we're gonna check AWS specific settings to make sure that you have the permission and you have a proper environment uh, to work with. So um, our goal is to uh, remove and lower the barrier for customer to move to the AWS environment. And that's the uh, power of open source and the collaboration with our partners at, like Proterra um, on AWS. Great. Thank you so much. So one of the things I hear about a lot is um, people, as in customers, don't think about engaging SUSE early in their SAP migration project. Because, um, you know, operating systems, some people feel like it's a little bit of an afterthought. So what would you say are the top three reasons why a customer should talk to SUSE, your OS vendor, early, even at the beginning stages of SAP migration? Yeah, so um, sometimes um, so people say that uh, uh, operating system is more like commodity. And uh, if it is working uh, fine, you don't feel it. But if something goes wrong with it, it just causes a, a lot of trouble because I consider operating system as the glue of the whole stack from uh, storage uh, network to the uh, operating system and also the applications running on top of it all rely on a working uh, pro uh, properly tuned operating system. And um, there is a difference in the choice of the uh, platform and you want to work with the uh, leader and uh, so my message is um, especially uh, when you uh, uh, start a journey to um, uh, create a mission critical uh, workload and by you you want to work with the, the developer uh, directly as early as possible because we can provide a lot of um, design review and also, um, besides the best practice, we can also uh, provide the lessons learned 
and uh, to help you prevent making the same error. Because there are some uh, common issues uh, that we have seen other customers uh, doing, then we can share our experience and help you to, uh, you know, be correct from the very beginning. Great. Thanks, Sherry. So those are my pre-prepared questions. Um, what about you guys? Do you have any questions for Sherry? Again, feel free to take yourself off mute or ask in chat. We have a shy audience. Are we all just ready to run off and eat cookies and candy that I sent? <laughs> probably you are enjoying your cocktail right now. Yeah, that's probably it. Well, in that case, then, we can wrap up the session early. So a mini commercial again, right? Go to bit.ly slash SUSE1111 to look at our webinar on some of the new services listing we have on AWS that can really help you get more value out of your investment on AWS. And I know most of you aren't going, but if you are, look us up. We'll be in Vegas from November 29th to December 3rd for a reInvent. So thanks again for your time, and we will see you at a future SUSE event, hopefully in person. Bye-bye. Take care.